Hello, this is video number two on the ketogenic uh, lifestyle. Video number one, we covered uh, how we got so fat, me included, uh, and uh, in detail, we discussed, or I discussed the uh, metabolic syndrome, uh, what it is, what causes it, uh, and uh, uh, what we need to do about it. So this video is actually the how-to video. How do you, in fact, solve this problem? Or how did I solve this problem in myself? How did I reverse my metabolic syndrome? Um, so my hope is by the end of this video, you will have a good understanding of uh, the ketogenic lifestyle uh, or keto and uh, how you implement uh, it in your own life. Uh, so what I uh, hope to cover uh, is a, first of all a brief synopsis of the first video, how we got so fat, for those that didn't see it. I'm going to talk about two hormones, uh, insulin and leptin. It's important that you understand uh, how uh, insulin works. Uh, and the, uh, in the first video, uh, there was, uh, I talked about hormones in a lot of detail. I covered uh, a lot of detail on uh, all of the hormones that are related to this. but. Uh, the most important one you need to understand is insulin and so we're going to go through that again the three ma uh, macros uh, carbohydrates proteins and fats and how they're related to the ketogenic lifestyle uh, what are ketones uh, it's very important that people understand what ketones are and how our body makes them and how we burn them our two energy storage systems uh, the, the, uh, the important thing here is that when you, uh, when you adopt the ketogenic lifestyle, you're actually switching from a carbohydrate uh, burning system to a fat burning system. So um, you need to understand the two systems and how they work. Uh, and and uh, when, you, when you're switching, how do you do that and what happens? Uh, what is nutritional ketosis, uh, how we get there and how we stay there. Uh, and then important facts and concerns about the ketogenic or keto lifestyle. In the first video, I showed uh, how uh, I grew up on a farm. I was the oldest of seven children. This is what we ate. Uh, most of the food that we ate was uh, food that we produced or grew ourselves. Uh, virtually no processed food. Uh, this is what we didn't eat. Uh, we didn't eat a lot of stuff from the stores. We didn't have a lot of sodas. We didn't eat a lot of sugar. Um, so, and this is what we looked like. Uh, and uh, the, in the 1970s, uh, Sweden came out with the first food pyramid. In 1992, the Department of Agriculture introduced our first food uh, pyramid, where we were to get, we were told, we were to get 60 to 70 percent of our calories from carbohydrates, uh, 20 percent from uh, meat and dairy, and on the tip there, about 10 percent from sugar and unsaturated, and, and unsaturated fats. Um, there was a big move back then to uh, vilify uh, saturated fats like butter uh, and lard and animal fats because of the feeling was uh, that it was, and they were wrong, uh, that this is what was causing vascular disease, all the heart attacks and strokes that were coming, uh, that, were, that the country was having, the people in, this, in America were having. Uh, we were to eliminate animal saturated fats and use vegetable oils and uh, that's when people switched from butter to margarine uh, and um, uh, we were to stop uh, using uh, all of the uh, animal fats. So this is what we thought the pyramid, uh, food pyramid told us to eat. Uh, a lot of dietetic foods came, uh, came up at that time, uh, foods that the food companies removed fat uh, f from, uh, from the foods, uh, but they had to replace it with something and what they replaced it for the most part was vegetable oils uh, and uh, sugar uh, because if they had to do something to make the food taste better as they took the fat out. So this is what we landed up eating. Uh, and after doing that for uh, 20 years, uh, 15 or 20 years, this is what we looked like. Uh, and if you ate uh, enough, long enough, you actually looked like a food pyramid. And half the country uh, today has metabolic syndrome. Uh, in the first video, I cover that in detail, but uh, just briefly, it's high blood pressure, uh, elevated uh, uh, lip, uh, the fats in your blood, cholesterol, uh, borderline elevated blood sugar, or actually uh, all the way up to frank uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, and obesity. 
Uh, the thing we can't see that's probably even more important than all the rest of these is there's a load of, where our cells get a tremendous amount of inflammation. So the first hormone we're going to talk about is insulin. It's released by the pancreas when you eat carbohydrates. Uh, it pushes sugar into all of your tissues to be burned. Uh, what isn't burned is stored by uh, as glycogen in muscle and liver. This is the uh, uh, water-soluble sugar that we can actually store in our bodies. Uh, and it pushes the liver to convert glucose to free fatty acids. Uh, and these are released in the blood and they can be burned or stored in the fat uh, as stored as fat in fat cells uh, and the liver. Very important, it blocks release. Insulin blocks the release of fat from fat cells. And you're going to hear this over and over again. Uh, it's very important to understand this and why, uh, if you have high insulin levels, uh, it's very difficult to lose uh, fat from your body. It also blocks the brain from feeling the satiety hormones. Specifically, the most important is leptin. This is a barometer of how much fat you have in your body. Uh, and if your leptin level, if you have 100, uh, 200 pounds of fat, your leptin level is going to be very high. The problem is that insulin blocks the brain from feeling the, uh, uh, the leptin. So uh, you may have an enormous amount of energy stored in fat in your body and yet your, your brain says, thinks you're starving. You're, and that's why people who are very overweight, very often, even though they're eating multiple times a day and they're eating even more than they're burning and continuing to gain, gain weight, they feel hungry all the time. Here it is uh, insulin response to the three macronutrients. The one in green there is carbohydrate. The simpler the sugar uh, and the higher the spike, the more insulin that's produced. Uh, and uh, or released from your pancreas and, and to clear the sugar out of your blood. Uh, very interesting, the middle hump there is protein. So protein can actually stimulate uh, insulin production and you'll see that later on why that's important. Uh, the one that's slowly absorbed is fat and it has virtually no insulin response uh, at all. There's no insulin release to, uh, to fat. So here's a graphic representation of my little grandson who's skinny. Uh, he wakes up in the morning, he's hungry, uh, his blood sugar is low, um, he eats his pancakes uh, swimming in uh, maple syrup or uh, the artificial syrups uh, that taste like maple syrup but they're mostly high fructose corn syrup. His sugar goes up, his insulin re uh, response is very quick and appropriate. Sugar goes down. And the reason why this is so quick is because he is highly insulin sensitive. Uh, he's very thin and does not have any uh, fat inside of his abdomen, uh, does not have insulin resistance. He has a normal response and uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is his response and the sugar is cleared out of his blood. Now if you look like this, uh, what happens is you develop insulin resistance. It requires uh, a higher and higher levels of insulin to clear the sugar from the blood. They did glucose tolerance tests in the 50s and then repeated uh, them recently on a large uh, a number of people uh, in the population and they actually measured insulin levels. And insulin levels today in people with normal blood sugars are actually two or three times what they were uh, 50 years ago. So the whole, our entire population, even normal people, are developing some level of uh, insulin resistance. So what causes this? Well, it's, it turns out it's caused by uh, fatty liver. Uh, here are two pictures of, uh, here's a picture of the two livers. On the left is uh, normal chicken livers. That's what a normal liver looks like, that color. And on the right is a duck liver that's swollen by fat. Uh, hundreds of years ago, the, the French actually learned how to, uh, to create this delicacy by force-feeding geese and ducks with large amounts of carbohydrates, either wheat or corn mash. Uh, they feed them many times a day, force-feed them, until they become morbidly obese and they develop a very fatty liver. This, this liver goes from a half a pound normally or less, uh, can go up to like five pounds uh, and with, when it's loaded with fat. Now, if humans eat carbs all day long uh, and we look like this, uh, then our, in fact, our livers uh, will look like this. We develop a fatty liver. Uh, and when I, uh, I had a screening test for an abdominal aortic aneurysm, uh, and uh, the only comment was it was the normal ultrasound, except uh, I had a, a fatty liver. 
which was what was causing my metabolic syndrome. Uh, so, uh, just going on in the insulin resistance, now because your energy stores are full, any excess calories you eat, they're stored in, as fat in your peripheral fat cells and in your abdomen, per, uh, infiltrating all of your organs. So, the liver, the kidneys, uh, the pancreas all get uh, infiltrated by fat and surrounded by fat. And there's, a, there's something called the omentum in your abdomen. This gets larger and larger. Uh, and this is the worst kind of fat. This is what the visceral fat. And this is what causes uh, the metabolic syndrome uh, that we're suffering from. So most importantly, your fat cells are unable to release fat because of the high insulin uh, levels. If you have insulin resistance, you're going to have very high insulin levels. And it's very difficult to mobilize fat out of your fat cells. So this is me when I weighed 225 pounds, or this is what I would imagine what was happening. Uh, every time I ate, uh, my sugar started out uh, at borderline elevated. It would go up. My insulin level, which was high, would even go even higher uh, to clear the uh, sugar out of my blood. But neither the insulin or the glucose would ever go back down to normal. So my insulin level was high, and when I would try to lose weight, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, even when I was on diet, I would restrict calories. I was hungry all the time. Uh, I never felt good and I never could maintain the diet for more than two or three weeks. I'd lose a few pounds and then gain it all back again. So now let's talk about the uh, three macro food uh, groups, the carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. Carbohydrates have four calories a gram, proteins have four calories per gram, and fats have nine calories per gram. There are no essential carbohydrates. So in other words, if you never eat a carbohydrate, you in fact uh, will not have any problems. Uh, you will, there's no malnutrition that's associated with, there's no conditions that are associated with uh, eating no carbohydrates. So let's talk about the three uh, types of um, carbohydrates, uh, sucrose, which is table sugar, uh, starch, and uh, the, the carbohydrates that is stored in our body. It's called glycogen. So table sugar or sucrose is made up of a glucose and fructose molecule. Uh, when in digestion, this is split and absorbed. Uh, glucose, you know what happens to that. Uh, fructose actually cannot be burned. Uh, you can't use this. Uh, what you did, what it does, is it goes into the liver, and the liver, uh, go, it goes through the, exactly the same pathway that alcohol does, along with all of the toxic byproducts that alcohol produces. Uh, so fructose is uh, very harmful to all of your cells in your body. Uh, it's converted to fat uh, in that process, and uh, then we can burn the fat or uh, actually store it in the liver and in the uh, um, in the peripheral tissues. So this is, these are all examples of sugar. So people think of sugar as white sugar or brown sugar, but these are all sugars. Uh, well, what about honey or maple syrup? Isn't that or organic honey or organic maple syrup? Isn't, aren't those good for you? No, they're all sugars. Uh, when they're broken down, they're all, they're all broken down into glucose. Uh, high fructose corn syrup, uh, the one on the bottom left there. And what this is, is... Uh, uh, it's seven times sweeter than sugar. Uh, it's very cheap to make, and this is why it's finding our, its way into all of our foodstuffs. Uh, the uh, the uh, sweetened uh, colas that we're drinking, the sodas that we're drinking, uh, have an enormous amount of sugar in them. Uh, the second one is starch. Again, four grams, four calories per gram. Uh, the starch is simply uh, glucose uh, hooked together in the chains. Uh, and if you look at, you can see those are glucose molecules. Um, so these are all examples of carbohydrates. You can have, if you have uh, non-GMO, organic, uh, sourdough, uh, brown, stone ground, stone baked brown bread, uh, when you digest it, it's still broken down into sugar. The third one is glycogen. This is the, uh, this is the again, it's uh, glucose that uh, is stuck together in chains. And this is what can be stored in your body from the sugar that you're eating. Uh, it's the, and you don't burn. This is actually stored in your muscles uh, and your liver for uh, immediate energy. Uh, proteins, um, proteins are the building blocks of our, of our cells and of our entire body. 
there are there are uh, proteins that are made up of 20 amino acids but there are nine essential amino acids these are these nine essential amino acids you have to eat them you cannot make them the other 11 you can actually your body can manufacture them uh, from the food that you're eating uh, proteins also have four calories per gram so you you do need to eat a certain amount of protein uh, but again, you'll, as you'll see later on, uh, the uh, ketogenic lifestyle is very moderate protein. It is not a high protein diet. So these are all um, uh, examples of proteins. Uh, protein is moderate. It's 0.8 grams per pound of lean body mass. So even though you may weigh 300 pounds or if you're at 260 pounds or whatever you weigh, you have a lean body mass. This is the, 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 your body mass that, is, uh, out, uh, that doesn't include the fat. And there's just sort of a rule of thumb. Uh, it's 0.8 grams per pound of lean body mass. Is, this is what your uh, protein requirements are. Uh, you can figure out what your lean body mass is. There are many calculators you can download from the internet that will give you your lean body mass as well, and as well, uh, they'll give it. It'll give you your BMI, your body mass uh, index, which tells you your level of obesity. Uh, <clears throat> here, there, there's a lot of good proteins on here. Uh, wild caught salmon, of course, is very good. Uh, is good. Do I need to eat grass fed beef? Uh, it's uh, very expensive. Um, uh, that's sort of the rage now, uh, and that'd be great if you can get it, uh, if you can uh, afford to buy it, then uh, that's good. Uh, if not, uh, the other kinds are just, are, are just fine. Uh, what's important is that you are eliminating carbs and uh, having moderate protein. Eggs are the perfect food. Uh, you, you know, eggs are good, and you'll find out uh, that uh, they're a very good source for snacks. Yogurt. Yogurt's terrific, uh, but you have to look for whole milk. It's not uh, non-fat yogurt. Or uh, and the big other big problem is most of the yogurts that you see in the stores uh, are laced with sugar, uh, and this is why a lot of people actually make their own uh, yogurt. Processed meats, uh, they're fine. They do have a lot of nitrates in them, but in moderation, they're fine. And of course, uh, seafood is uh, terrific. So now let's cover uh, fats. Uh, fats have nine calories per gram. Uh, the fat that we uh, eat and, uh, and is broken down into fatty acids, but uh, it's put back together with a glycerol molecule in our tissues, and that's how it's stored as triglycerides, and it also circulates in our blood as uh, triglycerides. Uh, there, there are two kinds of fats. There's uh, saturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, uh, as you can see in the picture there. Uh, good fats are uh, the saturated. This is opposite to what from what we've been told for we were told for many many years. Um, so butter, in fact, is good. Lard is good. Uh, all of the animal fats are good. Eggs, uh, bacon, um, uh, nuts. These are all um, for the most part uh, saturated fats, and they're uh, they're they're good fats. Um, olive oil is uh, very important. It becomes very important in this lifestyle. In the Mediterranean uh, diet, uh, large numbers of the ca amount of calories, in fact, come from olive oil. Uh, bad fats are the polyunsaturated. There's the vegetable oils. Um, they're not even made from vegetables. They are highly processed, processed uh, oils made from seeds. Uh, but 70% of your calories are going to come from these good fats on, uh, or saturated fats there on the left. The way you tell the difference is the uh, good fats are solids at room temperature and the bad fats are uh, oils at room temperatures. Well, won't all that fat kill me after we've been told all these years uh, that uh, saturated fats are bad for us? Well, now, after you look at the studies, many studies show that the LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, uh, um, very often uh, it goes down on the ketogenic diet. If it doesn't, uh, sometimes it uh, is unchanged or it can actually uh, go up. Um, but the, what happens is the particle size of the LDL goes from very small, which is harmful, to the large particles, um, which are, are harmless. Triglycerides uh, virtually always clear, and HDL, which is the good co cholesterol, virtually always goes up. So your body now burns saturated fats instead of uh, uh, storing them. So eating carbs makes you fat. That's what makes you fat. 
Eating fat makes you thin, which is very interesting. So as you convert uh, from burning uh, carbohydrates to, uh, to fats, um, uh, this is the way, this is what, what happens is your body uh, weight, uh, your, your body actually starts uh, using your fat stores and your weight goes down. It turns your body into a fat burning machine. My cholesterol, uh, I actually landed up on a statin uh, and uh, after I lost the weight and reversed my metabolic syndrome, uh, I was off the statin. My HDL uh, went uh, doubled, literally doubled, went from um, uh, around 30 to, a little, uh, to over 60. My ratios improved uh, and my cholesterols improved and my triglycerides completely uh, cleared. So now let's talk about ketones. Uh, you know, you talk to people and say, oh, I'm keto or I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the ketogenic diet. Uh, but if you ask them, well, what is a ketone, uh, they actually don't know. Uh, so here are the three ketones that are important. Uh, the one on the left is uh, acetone. Um, this is the one that you can actually smell on the breath of people that are in ketosis. Uh, and this, if it's very high, which is uh, in people who are in ketoacidosis or diabetic coma, um, these people are near death. It's very, very high levels of, uh, of your ketones. You can smell the acetone. Uh, it's very, it has a very characteristic odor. You smell it right away. Uh, acetoacetate is, is the ketone that's spilled in the urine. Uh, and that's what you measure with the keto sticks. Um, and uh, I did that initially. Uh, the problem is, is the kidneys get very good at reabsorbing uh, ketones because they're actually uh, energy uh, or food. Uh, so you, you start, uh, you know you're in ketosis after three or four weeks. You feel like you're in ketosis and yet your urine has no ketones. Uh, and that's why uh, I, I switched to uh, measuring ketones in the blood. That's on the right, that's the beta-hydroxybutyrate. That's what the meters um, uh, that's what they measure uh, is beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, so where are these made? Where are the ketones made? Uh, well, they are made uh, by the liver uh, from fatty acids you eat or from stored fat that are released. You can only make ketones if your uh, insulin levels are low. So if you have very high insulin level, if you have insulin resistance, um, it's very difficult uh, to make the, make the ketones. Not impossible, but it's difficult. They are excellent fuels, uh, and they can be burned by all of your tissues except red blood cells and the lens of the eye that require glucose. So here is the process of producing um, in the liver, of producing from fee fat, free fatty acids to the ketones. Uh, here's the other plot, very complicated. So this is a simple, uh, I've made this very simple. Uh, your fatty acids uh, come from your stores there on the right. Uh, they're released into the blood, the liver picks them up and it's put, they put it through the machine in the presence of, uh, if, if you have low insulin levels, uh, the fatty acids go into the liver and they can be produced, uh, turned into ketones. Uh, your muscles love ketones. Uh, the heart uh, muscle actually prefers ketones. Uh, we were told in medical school that the brain uh, can only burn glucose, and it turns out that's completely wrong. Uh, the brain's quite happy burning ketones for about 90% of its needs. Uh, the little bit of glucose it does need uh, can be produced by the uh, liver um, by a process called gluconeogenesis. The glycerol that you saw in the triglycerides uh, gets changed into uh, glucose uh, for the for the uh, parts of your body that in fact need glucose a little bit. You don't need to eat glucose or sugar. Uh, but what was very interesting uh, to me was the colon uh, is uh, its main source of fuel is something called butyrate, which is uh, made by fermentation of the in the in the uh, gut or biome uh, from fiber. And that's why people with irritable bowel syndrome, we put them on a high fiber diet uh, and the higher the fiber, the more butyrate and that helps uh, irritable bowel syndrome. But it turns out that beta hydroxybutyrate, the colon is perfectly happy with that. And a lot of people who go on the ketogenic diet, diet or they, they, they uh, uh, adopt a ketogenic lifestyle, uh, they actually, their irritable bowel goes away and they have normal bowel movements for the first time in their life.
So now I need to talk about the two energy storage systems in our body. The first one is carbohydrate. We store carbohydrate in our body in the form of glycogen. And this is stored in the uh, muscle cells in the liver uh, for rapid access in our whole body. We can, uh, we, we can break down glycogen uh, for glucose to be used by uh, all the cells in our body. So the, here's a representation of how much you have in your body, in your muscles. Uh, your muscles can store about 400 grams of, of glycogen. Remember, four calories per gram. So that's about 1,600 calories in your muscles of glycogen, carbohydrate. In your liver, it's 100 grams, which is about 400 calories. So that's about 2,000 calories that are stored in your body as glycogen. Uh, your blood sugar, uh, people say, uh, or if you ask somebody how, you know, how, much, uh, how much sugar do you think you have in your blood, and they'll say, uh, they'll, if they do guess, it's a cup or two cups. It's actually about two teaspoons. So if you have three teaspoons, you in fact uh, are frankly diabetic. I actually poured out the different amounts um, to just to show you uh, in the form of sugar what it, that would be, is that's the muscle glycogen on the left, the liver glycogen in the middle, and in the far right, this is what, how much sugar you would have in your blood. If you have as, uh, the much in the little pile there to the left of the normal, uh, if you have that much sugar in your blood, you are in fact, uh, frankly, diabetic. The second part of the energy storage system is fat. Uh, fat is stored in fat cells, but also in muscles. Uh, if you look at a steak, uh, the fat that you can see in the meat that is called marbling, uh, it's stored there, and it also can be stored in the liver, as you saw those uh, pictures of the fatty liver. There is a healthy amount of fat in a healthy person uh, of, with normal weight. But if you have large amounts, uh, particularly the harmful visceral uh, fat that we talked about uh, uh, infiltrating all of the organs, uh, uh, and the, the liver causing uh, the fatty liver, uh, when the fatty liver is what causes the insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, um, that's the bad news. What's the good news? The good news is that this is the first fat that is in fact cleared. Uh, so if you adopt uh, the ketogenic lifestyle or uh, virtually any way that you uh, start losing weight and burning fat uh, out of your body, uh, the first fat to go is the visceral fat. So if, even though you may have 200 pounds of fat in your body, you don't have to lose that to reverse your metabolic syndrome. Uh, if you've been on this for about uh, a month to six weeks or two months, uh, your liver, in fact, probably loses 30 or 40 percent of the fat that's in the liver. Uh, and all of a sudden, your blood pressures are falling to normal, your sugars are, are normal, and your cholesterol uh, starts to improve. In other words, you re reverse or dramatically improve your metabolic syndrome uh, relatively quickly. So here's the uh, glycogen, as we show the carbohydrate stores there on the left. Now your fat stores, This uh, I did this, I sort of looked at my own. I figured I had about 1,360 ounces of fat on me, which would be 152,000 calories. So when you think of 2,000 calories for glycogen, or 152,000 calories in your fat stores, obviously the fat stores are much, much better at storing energy uh, than, than your uh, glycogen or carbs. Uh, and uh, there's a reason for uh, this, uh, uh, you know, adaptively. Um, we uh, uh, evolved or um, uh, we developed um, those two systems, uh, but during times of plenty, uh, we would store fat in our fat cells, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, during times of famine or um, uh, when there was no food available, uh, we uh, would take it out of our fat cells um, and 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 burn that. Um, so here is a representation of our two systems. Let's say you have a carbohydrate. If you're carbohydrate dependent. Uh, you're burning uh, your glycogen. Think of this as a mini fridge, uh, and the other and your fat stores uh, would be your deep freeze. And just like in real life, uh, we um, we actually live out of your refrigerators, and uh, sometimes you you it may be weeks or months before you go down and get anything out of your deep freeze. 
So all day long, uh, we used to eat three meals a day, and now the average American eats six to 11 times a day. We get 70% of our calories from carbs, and we are actually all day long putting a, a sugar into our mini fridge and taking it out in between a meal of when we eat uh, in the form of glycogen, either building a glycogen or breaking it down. And we never actually uh, go to our fat stores uh, because are, uh, we don't need to. We're eating plenty of calories uh, in the form of carbs and our insulin levels are very high so we can't release uh, fat from, uh, from our fat cells. We don't do that. We just uh, live out of our glycogen. However, the insulin is still uh, uh, interacting with our deep freeze by pushing fat into the fat stores. It pushes fat into the fat stores but blocks the release. So you can put fat into your fat cells into your deep freeze, but you, it's very difficult with high insulin levels to take fat out. So what happens when you get to the fat adapted ketogenic state? Uh, your mini fridge is empty. You are now uh, tur have turned to your uh, fat stores uh, and uh, you're getting 70% of your calories that you're burning are coming from fat that you're eating and from fat fr uh, coming from your fat stores. Uh, and once you you uh, you have uh, adopt a very low carbohydrate lifestyle, um, uh, the insulin levels uh, go way down, uh, and you're able to do this. The other uh, interesting thing is that, as we talked about earlier, uh, with high insulin levels, your satiety hormones. Uh, your body doesn't respond to them to the uh, leptin, but now it can with low insulin levels, uh, and you're not hungry. That's the most interesting thing to me is you, is your hunger goes away. So now let's talk about nutritional ketosis. Uh, this was a term um, coined by uh, Stephen Finney, uh, who has some excellent YouTube videos and books. Um, but the ketogenic lifestyle is not new. As I mentioned before, our bodies are adapted to store fat during times of plenty and to use it during famine. The Inuit uh, up north uh, lived on, in the, in the old days, lived on seal blubber and whale blubber. They had no access to carbs uh, before the Europeans came. Uh, and they lived to be, uh, and they lived a very healthy lives just getting most of their calories from fat. The standard American diet that they now eat is in fact destroying them. Uh, so today, the world we live in, uh, the grocery stores never close, the famine never comes, so we never go and access our fat stores unless we actually do it deliberately by changing the way we eat. It's not for everyone. A uh, high-fat diet is actually can be very disturbing to some, especially after years of fat being vilified and saying it's very bad, saturated fats are very bad. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, you have to get used to this, used to the idea of doing it and figuring out how you in fact can get that many calories from fat. Uh, but it's very possible and it's uh, very easy. Uh, if you're sick, particularly if you're on your medication, you need to be under the supervision of a healthcare provider if you go down to uh, carbs as, uh, levels as low as you, as you need to. This is a lifestyle, not a diet. If you just think of it as a diet, I'm going to lose weight and then I'll go back to the way I used to eat. Uh, you're going to gain all the weight back again. Uh, this is very sustainable because uh, you're not hungry. Uh, and uh, if you learn how to do this, um, uh, you can remain in this lifestyle. Uh, Stephen Finney talks about, he's been doing this for 20 years and many people uh, who've adopted this, uh, uh, do this for, uh, this is, they change this for the, for the rest of their life. It does take some effort, uh, understanding how all of this works and uh, persistence uh, is the key. So how do we get to the fat adapted or the ketogenic state? Well, the first thing is you have to get carbohydrates down below 50 grams a day. In the induction phase, this is what Atkins talks about, the induction phase, you need to get down to about 20 to 30 grams a day. I think you need to be uh, 20 grams a day. Protein needs are moderate. As I said, 0.8 grams per pound of lean body mass. The average man has this, for the average man, this would be about 110 grams of protein, and for women, around 80 grams of protein. If you do this, this dramatically lowers blood sugar and insulin uh, levels, allowing you to fat adapt 
And what you do is you switch from carb burning uh, or living out of your mini fridge uh, to switching to eating fat out of your deep freeze and fat that you eat. And your satiety hormones, particularly leptin, starts working again so you are not hungry. Here, are the, here is a slide uh, borrowed from Stephen Finney. Uh, it's dietary protein and carbs by diet type. Carbs on the left and uh, protein on the bottom. Uh, the remainder of our calories are coming from fat, as we said. At the top is the Ornish diet. Uh, it's almost pure carbohydrates, uh, virtually no fat. We have our standard American diet is a mix of carb carbohydrates and fat. Uh, the Mediterranean diet, you're now getting down to uh, lower levels of carbs. Um, and uh, you're, not, you're not quite there, but uh, it's getting close. And a lot of your calories are, in fact, coming from uh, olive oil. Um, the paleo diet, you're now in low carb country, uh, but uh, the paleo diet is very high in protein. And as you saw from that uh, insulin response slide, uh, protein uh, stimulates insulin. So if you switch from uh, eating uh, carbs to eating a high protein diet uh, and a low fat diet, which is the, essentially the paleo diet, uh, your insulin levels can still keep you uh, out of ketosis because in the protein uh, is uh, stimulating insulin. The other problem is, is a high protein diet, uh, most people uh, after a while, they don't feel good. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult, it's virtually impossible to sustain and people just uh, quit doing it after a while and often gain their weight back. Uh, so the well-formulated ketogenic diet is the one in the uh, bottom. This is what Stephen Finney, the term that he uses. Now you're in very low-carb country, uh, moderate protein, uh, and the most 70% of your calories are in fact coming uh, from fat. So from a practical standpoint, how do you do this? Uh, I view this as two ways of doing this. Uh, there, are, there are multiple other ways that you can find out. Uh, but the first way is the Eric Westman uh, MD method. Uh, he's a physician in Duke and they, their clinics, they're very simple uh, and a very effective way of doing it. They just follow page four. Um, page four is, a, if, you, if you look at, is simply um, uh, of the food you, what you do is you eat the foods that are on page four. Uh, and if it's not on page four, uh, you don't eat it. You don't have to count calories. You don't have to check ketones. Uh, you just uh, follow the diet and you eat uh, to satiety. You eat till you uh, feel uh, like you've had enough. Uh, I started out that way. Uh, the problem I had with it is I was, uh, didn't know exactly where I was. Uh, I didn't know how many carbs. So I started uh, counting carbs and I started monitoring ketones, first of all in the urine with keto sticks, uh, and then after a while uh, the ketones disappeared, and that's, that's when I actually uh, went, I got a, uh, uh, a meter, uh, that keto meter that uh, uh, measured ketones in the blood, so I could follow my, the ketones in my blood to make sure I was in ketosis. Um, the meter that I got was the uh, Keto Mojo, uh, show, show this here. Uh, the reason I bought it is the reviews were very good and uh, the strips, uh, which are quite expensive, they're like little computers uh, to measure the ketones, are uh, fairly expensive and these were the, I thought, were the most reasonable. So um, method one is the easiest uh, and where you're simply uh, following uh, page four, you eat the foods that are on page four and you don't eat anything else. Uh, if it's not on page four, you don't eat it. It's easy. It's a good a good place to start. Place to start. Uh, but if you want to count calories, uh, that's a good a good idea, I think. And if you want to follow your ketones, that's also a very good idea. It's very uh, reinforcing. Uh, if you're if you're in ketosis, uh, you know you're doing it the right. If you if you're not in ketosis, you know you've got to figure out why. Uh, and and you know, that'll tell you why you're not uh, losing weight. I also have a I've got there are a lot of apps, calorie counting apps, uh, on online. They're free, uh, and I found that effective too. Because at the end of the day, you can push the button and you can figure out uh, 
uh, what percentage of your uh, foods that you're eating that day came from the three different macros. So how long does it take to go into ketosis? We used to, here's a uh, picture of a, a group of uh, obese subjects that uh, they put into starvation for 40 days. Uh, the first three days they were not on the, they were uh, eating normally. Uh, and then when the starvation started, after about three days, their ketones, uh, their, uh, their uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate goes to up to like 1.8 and gradually climb to uh, almost five and a half. Uh, so it takes about uh, four or five days, uh, this is even with starvation, to become keto, uh, to develop uh, ketosis. Uh, but um, it doesn't stop there. You, it ta really takes about four to six weeks to become uh, fully um, uh, fat adapted and only live out of your uh, deep freeze uh, and, and to become um, uh, uh, nutrition, to develop this nutritional ketosis uh, where, you, where you stay there. It takes to four to six weeks to become fully adapted. This is from uh, Stephen Finney. Uh, this is a very good representation. And if you look at the uh, gray on the left, this is uh, people that are carb adapted. Uh, they're not in nutritional ketosis. Uh, they're, they're mostly burning, they're eating out of their mini fridge. Now, if you uh, become uh, fat adapted uh, and you developed, uh, you, be, you go into ketosis, now you're in the green zone. Uh, I am, when I measure my ketones, I'm, I've never gotten above 1.5. I'm usually around 1, which is almost the edge of the, of, of the optimal area. Um, the uh, the uh, area on the far right, the red zone, that's for diabetic ketoacidosis. These people are near death. They'll run 10 or 20 uh, millimoles per liter. Um, but the optimal uh, range is about two to two and a half. I've never been able to get there, uh, probably because uh, I still have some element of insulin resistance. My wife uh, usually runs around... Uh, she's never been able to get above 0.7 and 0.5 is just the beginning of nutritional ketosis uh, but uh, that's because she uh, she actually she cheats so uh, this is the uh, uh, two books Stephen Finney and uh, Jeff Volek there's an excellent book the arts and science of low carbohydrate living and uh, Eric Westman uh, the physician from Duke uh, collaborated with these two gentlemen uh, and they wrote, they rewrote the Atkins book for the, the new Atkins for a new you, which is also an excellent uh, book. So here's 12 keto facts, uh, important facts that you need to know. Remember, this is not medical advice. If you have diabetes, heart failure, kidney failure, you need to do this under uh, the guidance of a physician or healthcare provider. Uh, the number one, you need to, in, in the induction phase particularly, you need to limit ca carbs to 20 or 30 grams per day. Number two, you have to eat until satisfied, uh, three times a day. And if you need to snack, go ahead. Uh, hunger makes you fall off the program. Uh, I find it uh, particularly useful to eat hard-boiled eggs. Uh, pork rinds are also another healthy snack. But as long as you're eating off page four, you're fine. But you have to eat until you're satisfied. If, you're, if you allow yourself to get hungry, uh, you're, uh, you, you'll eventually, this is not sustainable. So number three is follow page four. Even if you're using the calorie counting ketone measuring method, uh, follow page four. It's, quite, it's very useful. Uh, salt, very important. You have to eat salt. Now, uh, a lot of people uh, experience something that's called the Atkins flu or the keto flu. Uh, they think it's from uh, going into the ketogenic uh, state. It actually isn't. Uh, what, it, what happens is, uh, when you've been in ketosis for a few weeks, your kidneys actually uh, start excreting a lot of salt. And if you can't, if you excrete, if you don't have salt in your body, you can't hold on to water. So women notice this more than men. If you're puffy or bloated and if you have a little ankle swelling, uh, the, once you're in a ketogenic state, you lose uh, a lot of fluid and all of this goes away. Um, if you don't eat salt, and salt is different than uh, fat or uh, sugar, uh, glucose, uh, you can't store fat, uh, salt. Uh, whatever you lost the previous day, you have to uh, make up for it by eating it. So you're assuming you get about a teaspoon of salt from your diet, you have to make sure you're eating another teaspoon of salt in addition to that. 
Uh, so you eat salt to taste. And if you're feeling uh, the, the symptoms of uh, keto flu, which is uh, a dizziness, uh, fatigue, you just don't feel good, go ahead and uh, eat uh, salt. And uh, Stephen Finney talks a very good way of doing it is just uh, dissolve a bouillon cube in, uh, and uh, take one bouillon cube and, and a bunch of water and you'll uh, feel a lot better. You also should drink uh, plenty of water in this diet. Uh, or this lifestyle. So the other th the uh, the other thing to th what this explains is you talk to people and say, oh, I went on the ketogenic diet and I lost uh, uh, 15 pounds in uh, 10 days. Uh, well, no, you didn't. Um, that's uh, all. Does that is is fluid shifts. Uh, you can, as you'll see in a minute, you can really only lose about a pound and a half of fat per week. Uh, that's uh, to two pounds. That's best case. Uh, so, um, and because that's that, it's depressing if you lose a whole bunch of uh, weight and after the first uh, week to two weeks, and then you you seem to uh, it's very slow after that. Uh, you're not it's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just that the first week or two was not uh, was not reality. Magnesium deficiency is very common uh, in, in our society. They, a lot of people think it's because the soil has been depleted of magnesium. You need extra magnesium in this diet because the same thing happens with magnesium. You'll end up wasting some of that too. So you need a good, high-quality uh, magnesium supplement, uh, one that doesn't cause diarrhea. Uh, ionic magnesium doesn't as well as uh, magnesium that has, is, is uh, linked to calcium as well. So how do you know if you're magnesium deficient? Well, usually people who are, who, if your magnesium level goes low, you, you, you'll end up starting getting muscle cramps, leg cramps at night, uh, back cramps, arm cramps. And if you do that, you need to uh, up the amount of magnesium that you're taking. You don't do this if you have kidney failure, just like you don't uh, eat uh, extra salt if you have heart, high blood pressure or heart failure. Uh, all of this should give you a balanced nutrition, but taking a vitamin and mineral supplement supplements not a bad idea. This is not a high protein diet. I say this over and over again. Seventy percent of your calories have to come from fat. Protein stimulates insulin and can stop ketosis. This is probably the most difficult part of the diet. Losing your fear of fat after hearing it is uh, bad for you all of your life is uh, quite difficult. Number eight, you can't cheat. If you can't, well, actually, you can cheat. Uh, if you cheat, uh, people say, well, I'll go keto for Monday through Friday and then I'll do what I want on the weekend. Um, well, what happens is, uh, and you can, this is what's, what the value of measuring your ketones is. If, if you're keto, if you've you're got ketones in your blood uh, every day and then on Sunday you do a whole bunch of things, you're eating bagels or waffles and some syrup and everything else, if you check your ketones on Monday, they're gone. And you don't get your, get your ketones back again till Friday, so it's a good idea to just uh, continue uh, with uh, with the diet and or the the, uh, the uh, and don't don't cheat with uh, increasing the amount of carbs that you're eating. Beverages should be zero zero calorie. Black uh, coffee, teas are good. Lots of plain water. Uh, I think diet drinks are fine. People worry about the. Uh, uh, sugar substitutes, uh, but these are the same people that uh, don't think anything about uh, drinking, uh, high, you know, uh, so or drinks that have a lot of sugar in them, uh, which is uh, we all know how toxic sugar is. Um, alcohol should be avoided if you can't stop drinking. Well, maybe you have another problem. Uh, if you do drink uh, minimal dry wine or vodka, these do not stimulate insulin. They are not carbs. Uh, exercise. People say, well, should I exercise? Sure, exercise is good for you. Uh, it's good for your health. It's good for your heart, for cardiovascular fitness, but it's not necessary. If you uh, figure out how much, uh, how many calories you burn after an hour on the treadmill, it's like a slice of bread. It's not very much. It's very disheartening. The other thing is eat real food. Avoid processed food. If your great-grandmother great wouldn't recognize it, don't eat it. Avoid diabetic, uh, dietetic or uh, low-calorie uh, foods, um, but I think diet sodas uh, are fine. So the ketogenic diet is not only the best way to lose weight, it has potent anti-inflammatory properties, uh, uh, and we'll talk about it in another video. It's anti-aging, which is particularly pro important, I think, for the baby boomers, uh, in improving or eliminating the metabolic syndrome. 
and the other thing is instead of feeling deprived and fatigued uh, that, uh, that you do on a calorie restricted diet, you have minimal hunger and lots of uh, energy if you do it correctly. So let's talk about the keto lifestyle uh, for women, the average woman and the average man. So the average woman needs about 1800 calories a day, the average man 2200. So we start at the bottom there with uh, 20 gram uh, of carbs for both of them uh, times four is 80 calories. Uh, then you add your protein, uh, moderate, 300 and some for women, 400 and 450 for men, that's moderate protein. Uh, and then the rest of the calories uh, up to your, remember you're trying to lose weight, so you're, you're not uh, going to be, you hopefully aren't eating uh, uh, to the, your full uh, calorie requirements. Uh, so you have about 800 calories uh, of fat for women and 1,000 calories for men, which will take you up to the 1,200 calories for women and 1,500 calories for men. So rest of the, where do the rest of the calories come from? Well, I'm sure you know by now uh, those, the, the, the difference between what you're eating and what you're burning, uh, in fact, come from your deep freeze. They're coming from your body stores because at that carb level and at that protein level, your insulin levels are going to be low. So you can turn around and pull that fat out of your fat stores. So how does this work for the hypothetical, uh, the man with a hypothetical lean body mass of 110 pounds, regardless of how, what his actual body weight is? Uh, say he's eating, uh, he needs 2,000 calories a day. Uh, which is uh, 20 to 30 grams of uh, carbs he's going to start and the 0.8 grams per pounds of lean body mass. Um, so he's 110 uh, pounds of uh, lean body mass. And if you look at the left column there, that's the induction phase. Uh, he's going to be eating 88 grams of protein. That's 0.8 times 110. Uh, he's uh, uh, about 20 grams, I, I, I have 30 grams of carbs here, that's a little being a little lenient, uh, times four calories per gram, that's 120 calories in carbs. And then the rest of it is made up by ingested fat, uh, 30, 81 grams, uh, and then 800 and 730 calories is what, remember, nine times the, 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 nine, the each fat, uh, gram has nine calories, so that's where you get your uh, your rest of your calories. Now, b above that, because that's only about twelve hundred and fifty calories, uh, all the way up to the uh, two hundred is uh, what we're uh, two thousand calories that you're burning comes out of your deep freezer, or comes out of your body stores. This is induction. This is the first week to uh, two or three weeks uh, when you're first switching from carbohydrate adapted to the fat adapted lifestyle. So now we go through the period of uh, weight loss and that's all depend, how long is that? Well, it depends. If you have 50 pounds of fat to lose, it's gonna be different than if you have 300 pounds of fat to lose. But if you look, the amount of protein is the same. It's 88 grams. Uh, you're gonna liberal, you'll have liberalized your carbs a little bit. Uh, your, your fat you're eating is a little bit more than you when you started because you've gotten uh, uh, used to eating fat and you've actually figured out how to eat that much fat. And the rest of it comes uh, from your body stores. So you do that up till, till you hit your target uh, weight. And now you're on maintenance. And this actually becomes more difficult because your 88 grams of uh, protein is the same. You're going to have liberalized your carbs. Uh, but now you have to eat uh, the, uh, the majority of your calories you have to, uh, that you're getting from fat. You're not pulling them out of your fat stores out of your body. You're actually having to eat them. So you, you, uh, you have to learn how to eat that much fat. Uh, so how much carbs can you eat uh, once you're in maintenance? Well, that's where measuring your ketones is actually a very good idea because you can liberalize your carbs from 20 to 30 grams uh, up to you know, 40, 50, 60, uh, 70, and you may find out you can eat 100 grams of carbs a day. Uh, probably not, but at some point your ketones are going to disappear from your blood uh, and then you back down again so that you're, you're still uh, spilling ketones or you're still having ketones in your blood. So here are some uh, ketogenic uh, lifestyle concerns. Um, uh, one of the most common is why can't I get into ketosis? So I go, I'm on the ketogenic uh, diet or I've, I've adopted the ketogenic lifestyle. I've gone low carbs and I just don't seem to be uh, get into ketosis. 
Well, I think one of the commonest reasons is uh, that insulin resistance we've talked about. Uh, and some people get need to get down to uh, very low levels, even below 20 grams of carbs a day. Uh, the other problem can be is carb intake is too high. Will you fool yourself? You think you're on 20 grams of uh, carbohydrates a day, particularly if you're not counting carbs. Uh, and it turns out you're actually on, uh, you know, 60, 70 uh, grams of carbs a day, when, which will keep you from going into ketosis. You won't go into ketosis. The other uh, thing is that protein can sneak in there. If you, if you uh, actually go on a high protein diet, uh, you don't mean to, but you do because you're not eating enough fat. Uh, you've lowered your carbs very low. Uh, you're not eating enough fat, so what else do you eat? You have to eat, you eat protein. So, and we know that protein uh, stimulates insulin, uh, and that can uh, stop you from going into ketosis. The other thing is medications. It's uh, something simple as uh, nasal steroids can uh, you take for allergies. Uh, and there's enough that's absorbed that it uh, blocks uh, ketosis, and there's another, a few other medications that can do that too. Uh, should I take uh, ketone supplements? Uh, that's not necessary. Uh, you can actually buy ketones and take them by mouth, uh, but it's kind of dumb because uh, what you're trying to do is go, go into ketosis by, by uh, uh, mobilizing fat and having your liver turn uh, the fat into ketones uh, rather than taking uh, ketones uh, by mouth that are, that are uh, um, supplements that are made. Um, the other, uh, there are other supplements that are actually helpful. Uh, vitamins, minerals, and amino acid supplements uh, can be uh, helpful, particularly if you go to the next uh, uh, level that we're talking about in the, in the video number three. So why have I stopped losing weight? Uh, everybody hits a plateau, I think. Uh, it's very common. You get down to us, you lose weight, you get, you're doing great, and then all of a sudden, it, you just grinds to a halt. Well, the first thing you need to do is be a little bit patient, uh, wait for two or three weeks to make sure that you're, in fact, uh, I have lost weight. Uh, because when you lose weight, it's, it's not a gradual, a straight in, uh, line uh, down. It actually it's a, happens in a stepwise fashion. You suddenly lose uh, four or five pounds, and then you don't lose for a while, and then you lose uh, you know, three, four, or five pounds again. Uh, so the other thing you need to walk, look for is carb creep, particularly if you've been on the diet for quite a while or the, uh, it's very easy to have carbs creep in somewhere. Uh, protein intake, you got to watch that because we know that uh, if you're eating too much protein, that can stop things as well. The, probably the most common cause is uh, cheating. Uh, so we don't do that. Just uh, double down and make sure that you're uh, following things correctly uh, and getting, get back into ketosis medication we've talked about. So what's the solution if you hit the plateau and you've stopped losing weight? Well, for me, I hit about 200 pounds and then I stopped losing weight. Uh, and the, the reason um, uh, I did that, I went through everything, my carbs and everything, I just couldn't seem to, to get going again. Uh, and I went, that's when I went to uh, intermittent fasting, which will be the, uh, uh, the, the next video that we talk about. Um, so the ketogenic lifestyle takeaways, what are the takeaways? Number one, uh, it's low carbohydrate. You've got to get down to 20 to 60 grams a day. Uh, and, uh, you, you, you should be well trained on that exactly where you need to be when you start as, and as you go through this, it's moderate protein. Um, eat to, number three is eat to satiety. Uh, you, you have to eat 70% uh, of your calories need to come from fat. Uh, if you restrict calories and you're hungry, uh, you won't last. You, people, that's why people fall off the diet. So snack off page four if you're hungry. Uh, adequate intakes of electrolytes, uh, minerals, and vitamins to avoid the uh, keto flu or muscle cramps. Um, so particularly salt and magnesium, you have to make sure you're getting adequate amounts of that. Follow the Westman method, page four. Uh, even if you're using uh, the ketone, um, um, uh, measuring your ketones uh, and counting carbs, it's a good idea to simply follow the page four as well. Avoid cheating. If you do, don't get depressed. Just uh, get back on things uh, and uh, uh, get those ketones back up in your blood. Just get back on track. This is a therapeutic program. I'm not giving it medical advice. If you have a medical illness, particularly if you're on medication, you have to do all of this under the direction of uh, your healthcare provider. So good luck with your journey to weight loss, uh, good health, uh, and boundless energy. 
and uh, stay tuned for video number three on intermittent fasting uh, where I'm going to talk about the uh, pros and cons and the how-tos of uh, intermittent fasting. It's actually quite easy, just uh, quit eating. But uh, there's a few more details than, uh, beyond that. So we'll see you then at the uh, video number three. Thank you for your uh, attention.